Okay, so, yeah, name of a sermon, I'm not that, it feels like I'm not that good with names for sermons, but I, yeah, don't, don't want it to just be all a giveaway in a sense. Um, so I try to be creative, but, yeah, I've, I realize I think differently than some people, and when I put something down, people interpret it differently, so I'd rather have a, something that doesn't make sense initially, and then you're forced to follow. Um, so, the flow-through principle, is it fine? There's no, can I move this thing? Camera people, I don't know, is there someone I should ask permission for? Huh? Can I? Okay. I'm not, I don't have a lot of slides anyway, but it just feels then like I don't have to focus on that. So, flow through principle, um, what it actually means, or what I felt with it, I'm just going to share a verse or two that I also felt this morning. Um, the one in Matthew 7, um, where, and I'm going to read it from verse 24, where Jesus speaks about the person building on rock versus the person building on sand. And then it says that there's the one who builds on rock. I'm going to paraphrase it to keep it short. The one who builds on rock and then the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And then there's the guy who built on sand the same rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And we're all, especially in the if I, general sense, busy building our lives. And the interesting thing about, I always thought building on rock or building on sand is you don't go build on a dune. You go to a very rocky place and you build there. But in Galilee, where Jesus was teaching this, there was basically a lot of sand at a lot of places. So the thing was not, not building on sand, but was digging deeper till you get to the rock so that you can build on rock. So it's not building your life on, call it, super, or I don't want to say superficial truth, but digging deeper into it. And the, prince, the, the biblical principles are life-giving. And that's what Jesus is saying in that parable story, that if we build on his word and do it, then when the storms come, um, the, the house will stand. And that's what we want for all of us, right? Um, I had a vision about two weeks ago that I think f fits in for me. It was like almost someone in a train carriage, um, like a, a fright carriage and almost this idea of you're sitting in like a container type box and the feeling was it was almost like they were in like Ukraine in the war and they just wanted to get out and they had all their belongings next to them on this platform and they were waiting for an opportunity just to get out and it was almost this feeling of somewhere there's going to come a train and then you're going to have like split second grab your stuff and just go for it. Um, and otherwise, you're going to miss it, and you're going to remain there. And in this vision, I just felt when the opportunity came, the person was looking back at their stuff and thinking, I know I need to get out of this place. It's really bad, but I can't part with my stuff now. And that split second in terms of holding on to their stuff meant they missed the opportunity. And... It just speaks to that, for me, to that hunger we need to have when following Jesus. Not to look back at our own stuff, our life, holding on to that, but being ready to just let go. Counting, valuing him more than our stuff. And a parable in Matthew 13 that speaks to that is the parable of a treasure in the field of a guy who went and he found a treasure in a field, and then it says, in his joy, he went and sold everything, and he went and bought that field. 
And sometimes we find that treasure. Um, we see Jesus. We see that's what we want. We hunger after it. But then when we go back to sell everything, we're like, whoa, hold on. Am I really going to sell everything for that? Was it really that great? Is that... And or we just pause for a moment and we don't go and buy that field. And if we go to the next slide, there's this verse in Hebrews 2 that says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So Jesus came, and I'm jumping in deep here, but Jesus came and he, he died for us. He gave us salvation. The Father provisioned that our sins can be paid um, by the blood of Jesus and by the sacrifice that he made so that we can be free. And once he has set us free, the, the, I think John 8 says, whoever the Son sets free shall be free indeed. Once we are set free, we're free, right? But we have a responsibility in stewarding that as well. It's not just a case of you've received a status or a tag and then you're free to go and do what you want. We have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We have to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So we need to do something on our side. Not to earn our salvation. We're saved by grace through faith. But we still need to play our part. God has given us a role to play in this as well. In stewarding our salvation. And bear fruit in keeping with repentance. John 15 speaks about the tree. Um, that if it doesn't bear fruit, it's cut off. And we need that godly fear when we come to God. I mean, he sent his son to die for us. He gives us salvation through faith. It's not by our works. But we need to realize we have a part to play um, in accepting that. And that's almost the framework that I want to create when I speak about basically forgiveness because many times when we think about forgiveness in a general sense we've had some good teaching on it the practical part of it we all know like what Mandela said um, if you drink unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the person next to you dies um, and we know that doesn't work like that and even secular culture is also acknowledging that truth you have to forgive don't have hardness of heart but the core of it for us is not because it's a good thing or because we need to do it. It's, a, as we will see, it's a requirement in following Christ. It's not really something we have a choice in, like I'm going to wear green or blue tackies when I run or use this or that gear. It's a commandment from Christ. And with that we can maybe go into the parable that I want us to work through this morning. And you can follow with me on your phone um, as we read in it's Matthew 18 from verse 21. And it's the parable of an unforgiving servant. Um, and in terms of the flow-through principle, why well, I called it the flow-through principle in some for financial professionals, they might know the term from tax or other legislation, but basically it's like, if you think just of a hose pipe with water running through it, the water runs through the hose pipe, so it flows through. We're a vessel for God's glory, right? So the God forgave us through Jesus Christ. We have received complete forgiveness, but it needs to flow through us. And back to the house principle built on rock, we need to apply this principle in our lives. Because 10 or 20 years from now, I think unforgiveness is one of the things that trips up believers. It's one of the big things I think that trips up believers or gets them just to stop following Jesus in some way or be more hesitant about following and, and when we're young, and I'm not saying all things are going good, but I mean, life is exciting. But as things go on, there's more like, um, 
whatever waves and rain and stuff hitting you and after a while um, it starts affecting one and you just don't feel like forgiveness anymore. I chatted to an older guy yesterday that had this small business and he was just complaining of how, govern how basically because of government um, rules these days and the slow processing that's happening on that side how it has basically inflicted pain on his business and I could see he was caught up in, in unforgiveness and just for us to apply this principle and I almost want to want you to see it maybe you're not thinking there's not something specific when it comes to unforgiveness now it's not about today I'm not talking about forgiving people as much as I'm talking about it being a res or response to God and honoring his word and that principle in our lives. And to think for yourselves, how are you going to apply this in 10, 20, 30, 40 years time? If you want to follow Christ, seek his kingdom, in f maybe now you can handle things, but in 40 years time, implement and tranche this principle in your life. Make the decision to build your house on the rock. Sometimes we just want to get moving with things. We want traction. So we build our house on the sand and at least now we can show everyone we have a sand. But we know sometime the rain is going to come. Okay. So that's the intro. So if we, we start reading there from Matthew. Um, then Peter came up to him, that's now Jesus, and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I will forgive him? As many as seven times, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but I say to you seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay them, his master ordered him to be sold, with his wife and his children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity, the master of the servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that, all your debt because you pleaded with me. Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Um, I actually thought somewhere maybe we could get the interns to act it out for us. thought that would have been quite cool, but I, I didn't know how your guys' acting skills are. So maybe next time, unless you guys want to vote and have them act it out, we can, <laughs> we can try that. Um, but we see if, so characters here is the obviously the unforgiving servant we have a king and we have one of the unforgiving servants friends although after this I don't think they will call each other friends anymore now the part where that stood out for me or well I'm so I'm gonna just go through this bit of rolling commentary if we read that first part and Maybe say, Brant, if you can just go back to the first part of the verse, 21 to 22. Um, we read there, Peter came up and said to him, Lord, 
How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As much as seven times. Now, I don't know who of you have uh, watched The Chosen and you've seen how they portray the character of Peter, but he was kind of like an upfront guy, um, came with ideas and things. And he, he was thinking that he was quite generous here, saying seven times. He was thinking everyone is going to feel quite impressed with him saying, as much as seven times, Lord. Um, and then Jesus replies and says, no, not seven times but 77 times. So, I mean, you, want, you're a, you do maths. What is 7 times 77? Or any other smart person here? <laughs> 5, 3, 9. Okay, Gert says he doesn't need a brain, he just needs a calculator. Um, but Gert is smart and other things. So. Um, but so that's a lot of time. So was Jesus saying, remember, what's the number Gert? 539. Five, you have to keep count of the number of times someone sins against you. And if once you read five, reach five, number 540, you know you don't have to forgive him anymore. Was that kind of like what Jesus was saying? Maybe because I think you would have lost count and just kept on forgiving anyway, right? So maybe that was a, a practical part of it. But I think Jesus wasn't really speaking to the um, quantity of times, but to the extent that we forgive. He was basically saying we need to come forgive completely and many times I find myself like like Peter you know we want to draw the line when is enough enough Lord my brother has sinned against me when is enough enough we want justice we, we in that sense want punishment to happen for when wrong was done so maybe uh, it's disclaimer when I speak about forgiveness, I'm not addressing boundaries. Interestingly, just the uh, paragraph just before what we read, Jesus is actually speaking about when your brother sins against you, take him alone, go speak to him. If he doesn't listen, take two or three witnesses together and so forth. So the Bible speaks about boundaries and, and those things. I'm just focusing on forgiveness um, right here. So Jesus was not speaking about the number of times we need to forgive, but to the extent. Um, and yeah, again, maybe if you kept count, you would have gotten lost anyway. Um, but I think I f sometimes catch myself thinking that forgiveness is almost a, a get out of jail free card. And, and maybe it is, but... I find that with Peter's response, he says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And the focus there is not as much on what's right, but almost on the effect it has had on me. And not to, again, downplay any scenarios where there's trauma and, and that just speaking to, to where there's sin. Um, and many times we would find that forgiving others almost like a grudge purchase. You, you have told the person and he keeps sinning to you or not being aware of what he's doing. And, you know, different personality types rub each other continually. So if you just think about it in that way, um, Renske don't laugh too much. Eh? Um, um, but, yeah, so you see that dynamic working there and then if we go to the next verse we see um, Jesus beginning therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle his counts the kingdom of heaven can be compared with so we know the our father our father in heaven Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So 
So we want God's kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus is, through this parable, unpacking a dynamic that plays out in the kingdom. And almost, if you want to say it, a, a rule of life in the kingdom. How things work. And it goes on it, um, in the, our Father. When we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. So for us to think about how do we set our minds on things above and not on things of the earth, like Colossians 3 um, tells us to, this is a principle where Jesus says this is how things should work and play out that we should apply in our life. So the kingdom of heaven is, is like that and it can be compared to that. And just the reality that forgiveness in the kingdom, like I said, is the, it's the extent to which we forgive. It's not the number of um, times that we forgive. And if we go on with that part, where he says, when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owned him 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 talents, some commentary would put that at um, $6 billion in today's value, give or take 120 billion rands. The, it doesn't really matter the size of the amount, but the fact that it was an unpayable amount. It's funny that the guy says, give me time and I'll repay you. He wasn't able to repay. He was lying, right? Um, or maybe not lying, just desperate to get out. But it, he wasn't able to repay. It was a, the idea is that it's a big amount. And that, bringing that back to us, that um, refers to the sin that we have as people. The massive debt that we owe a righteous God because he's holy and because of our sins. Um, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So there's no way that we can pay that debt, even if we like the guy in the story says, um, I will repay you everything. We're not able to repay it. Because the only thing that we'll get is like Romans says, the wages of sin is death. So what we should get is the wages of sin, which is death. But in no way are we able to repay um, that debt. And we see then on how he says that um, the king pitied him. And then, well, first he said he's going to, his wife and his children and everyone is going to be thrown into jail until payment is made. But then the servant fell on his knees and asked for patience, and the master released him and forgave him all his debt. And that speaks to God's great mercy and patience in withholding that um, righteous judgment that should come our way. Um, and also his provision through Christ's death in terms of paying for our, our debt through the cross and breaking the power of sin. We see that in Romans six twenty three summarizes that for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. And our sin required God's righteous judgment. But we didn't receive it. And that is speaking back or looking back at Hebrews 2 where it says, How shall we escape if we ignore? neglect such a great salvation if we walk away from that and don't realize the cost of that and how impossible it was and what jesus did for us on the cross it's not like he's going to be crucified again as hebrew says he has paid once for us it's then our responsibility to receive salvation and walk um, according to god's ways and seeking him and if we then go on then we see that immediately, basically, the servant went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. So compared to the 120 billion, this is like, let's say, I don't know, maybe not even a few thousand, few hundred, um, but it was nothing. It was something that the guy could actually repay. 
And we see his reaction in that moment was that he choked him and said, pay what you owe. And because he couldn't pay it, he threw him and his family in the prison until he could pay his debt. So he received the clearance of his own debt, but he couldn't pass that on. That um, love of God that he received couldn't flow through him to the person um, next to him in terms of forgiving him. And then that begs the question, to, to what extent, and just bringing it back to us, to what ex it shows the extent to which um, God's mercy did not have a saving effect on him because he didn't receive it and he didn't pass it on. He didn't forgive um, his, his fellow uh, person. So, and that's when we speak about um, what I mentioned initially in terms of uh, the vision, if you like, where the guy couldn't let go of his luggage to, to jump and to reach out to Jesus. Sometimes in that moment, we have already received so much through the blood of Jesus and compared to the sin of those around us, it doesn't compare. What we've been forgiven of doesn't compare to what we should forgive. And then it makes sense when Jesus told Peter, Hey, the guy since you 70 times 7, you still need to forgive him. Because compared to what you've been forgiven of, you should forgive. And why would Jesus ask that of us? Because he has set us free to such an extent and wants us to walk in that freedom. And the way we live it out is by being Jesus to others or, or acting it out. It's almost validating the freedom that we have received through the cross by living it out. And, I mean, sometimes I find myself thinking of forgiving someone as an optional thing to do. Or maybe over time I would do it. And again, it is a process. It doesn't mean it's instant or, or anything like that. Many times one would need to go for, for counseling or work with someone with you to support you and in, in, in working through that and forgiving but the fact that is it's not an optional thing from our side that is a problem if you want to call it that that we should figure out learn get the right skills how to forgive people and work through it and endure in forgiving them and that it's not going to be easy those are all facts but the thing is we can't just move on and not forgive because in terms of in consequences, we've seen that there's consequences to that. Um, while I just take a sip of water, just give a person next to you a high five. If I can use the ABS term, are you with me? So we said to, in order to accept the gift and accepting the kingdom and receive, um, in that sense, steward our salvation that we have received, we have responsibility to forgive others. Sorry, I have notes on two devices. I guess that's not the smartest thing, so I'm trying to see which one works best. <laughs> forgive me, please. I hear a bit of murmuring when I ask that. Will you forgive me, please? <laughs> okay, so... So, and just in terms of... I'm jumping a bit around, but I'm just finding my place there. So, in terms of receiving forgiveness, we need to forgive because it's almost like we, we can't really receive that forgiveness if we don't forgive ourselves. And it's important to remember what we've been forgiven about of and what we have received. Um, 
for, because from, if you think about it, heaven's view, forgiving should almost not be a thing given what we've been forgiven of. And it's, we cannot represent heaven if we do not forgive. And I know that sounds harsh, but practically if you think through what Jesus went um, and that's the ultimate gift is salvation and that he forgave us our sins. It's asking of, uh, of us to do the same. And again, we might struggle with it. That's okay. I think it's just the fact that we, in faith, trust him in, in completing that. So by forgiving others, we walk in that freedom which Christ has set us free in. And sometimes we can, I find myself praying for God to deliver me from a person, but while I should just be forgiving that person, not asking for deliverance from them. And maybe we might hope that, okay, I'm not going to, I don't feel like I can forgive that person, but I'll ask forgiveness from God later. But that's not really how it works. How it works is you forgive a person. You don't ask God to forgive you for not forgiving that person. You can do that if you haven't done it, but in the end, you're going to have to forgive that person, right? So one way or another. And just the fact that he has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of his beloved son. That's the reality that we've been delivered into. So part and parcel of our new creation is to forgive others and to, to walk it out. And then if we go to the consequences in, from verse 31, we see when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until they should pay his debt. So also my heavenly father would do to you, every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That should kind of like strike the fear of God in your heart, if you think of it, because we obviously focus on the true aspect of God as a loving father, but we also realize here that he has also given us a responsibility. And, you know, it doesn't mean that it's going to be fair. Most, a lot of the times, there's a lot of injustices in the world. And you see why Jesus almost had this in, in his one thing. He said, if you make a child stumble from following me, um, it's better that a, a rope be around your neck and you'll be thrown into the sea. And that doesn't mean a, only a small child that refers to young believers or people that you make to stumble. And then they end up uh, their hearts being hardened towards God. And you can see um, that God's desire for justice, for us not to perpetrate that process, even unknowingly, of hardening others' hearts so that they end up not forgiving. Because we see it's almost a case of, in that sense, rules are rules. Um, it's unfortunate and it's heartbreaking to think that someone might have unforgiveness because of really horrible stuff that happened to them. And yeah, I'm leaving a lot of questions on the table that I'm not going to answer now. Um, but that's things the Bible speaks to. So if we choose to live by God's ways, we need to be also choose to be treated by them in that sense. Matthew 6 verse 14 to 15, just after the Our Father, where we seek um, heaven here on earth as it is in heaven, it says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I mean, that's what it says. So if we do not forgive we will not be forgiven. And we realize how quickly something like that can happen, even slight sins against us. Um, and it just calls us to pick up our cross and die to self. I don't know if this is a saying, but I've heard it, that if you kick a dead dog and it bites you, it's not dead. If you kick a dead dog and it bites you, it wasn't dead. And many times that's the same with us. If, if we feel that 
thing happening to us when you realize maybe you're not really dead to self. There's something being triggered in you and, and it's worth investigating. And it just is a call for us to pick up our cross and follow Jesus daily and to walk it out. It's not going to be easy. So the Bible says rejoice in suffering and various trials. This is part of it. Just forgiving someone because they sinned against you entails some sort of suffering. You need to die to self. And you cannot, in that sense, say you believe but you don't forgive. You can. I mean, then you can, like one of the disciples, say, help us in our unbelief. So I want to distinguish between where we're feeling weak and we feel like we cannot forgive now, but we know we need to forgive and we need support and we need counseling versus a hard no. But I think we should be wary to know that it starts at a place where we feel feel we cannot forgive and then we leave it and over time it festers and that thoughts our brain is are amazing what we set our brains on it builds brain paths and later on it becomes strongholds so it's the same with truth and lies we believe and in that sense we need to work hard at make making a decision that we're gonna forgive because hey Jesus forgave us and he forgave us of a lot more and remember this for 10, 20, 30 years time. Not only for now getting things off your heart now, which is also important, but it's when you're that, you know, 50, 60, 70 year old person, are you going to be someone with hardness in their heart that spoke of uh, young days when things went well and then where a lot of bad things happened and now you struggle to receive God's joy in, in that phase of your life. We don't have to be like that because Jesus set us free. But it's our decision. I think this is sometimes where it's difficult. We need to make a decision to build that house on rock and not on sand. And the nice thing, if you want to put it that way, is as you practice forgiving, the next time it would be easier to forgive. So if you have a scenario where you need to forgive now, it's an opportunity for training for next time. So if we go to that verse, in maybe closing, um, that treasure in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. What of the servant or, or um, the unbelieving, uh, not unbelieving, unforgiving servant, um, was this guy who found a treasure in a field, but because of his unforgiveness, he didn't give up his life. So think of selling all you have doesn't only refer to possessions, it refers to surrendering your life for the sake of getting the kingdom. And this guy didn't give up his rights to, I mean, he, obviously we sometimes feel we have a right to withhold forgiveness. And that's fine if we want to play that game, but we saw what the word said happens when. Then we need to, will be um, judged according to, to those rules we set. And just an encouragement for us to focus on Jesus and what he has done for us and cultivate just the appreciation and a deep joy for, for what he has done for us on the cross. Because it's sometimes difficult in that moment to go to a theoretical fact of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But spend time in adoration with him. And then when those things happen, it's obviously easier. But the fact remains that it's a decision that we need to make in terms of submitting to the truth. Um, it's not only for our free of it's not only a principle for us to walk in that freedom, but it's also principle in terms of submitting to the truth of God. So with that, um, we want to close for us, and maybe the, the band or someone in the band can come to the front. And if there's something you feel you want to forgive someone of, I don't. This is. It's not necessarily, I don't want to go big now on going through everyone you need to forgive. But if you have that tug or you feel that prompting, do come to the front so that someone can pray for you with that. 
but I almost want you to make that decision in your heart. Just make the decision that you're going to start forgiving. You're going to forgive as Christ has forgiven you. It's a mental, it starts maybe just with a mental or a yes from your heart. It might not be easy to start with. But again, not for the sake of you suffering because of the fact that you don't forgive, but because of you follow Jesus and honoring God in that. So with that, um, maybe Aubrey, you can eat the lines for us there. But as we stand just to, to worship, um, for ministry, for those who, who feel that you actually have something that Holy Spirit or you just feel it the whole time, you're reminded of someone you need to forgive and you can, you almost feel the jailers upon you in that sense. You come to the front that we can pray for you. But then at the same time, I just want to encourage us just to make that decision. And maybe while we close our eyes, um, if you want to make that decision, just in terms of a step, terms of saying yes lord that's what i want to do i don't have a strength i don't feel like i have a strength to just go for this it feels beyond me and actually that's perfect because you're not forgiving from your own strength you're not forgiving from your own love remember flow through principle what you receive you give it's um, by us hearing god waiting on him and receiving from him that we can grant forgiveness to others not because of our own strength or because we're like super focused so with that just for to just acknowledge that to god in your hearts you just want to raise your hand if that's you and i just want to spray a prayer of agreement so father thank you just for your truth lord and with, as your word says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free father we thank you this for you came to set the captives free and that includes us and that includes the world around us father and we want your kingdom to come here on earth as it is in heaven that's our desire father and we long to walk it out in the way that jesus that would please you just with that we we can just make that commitment we thank you just for hearts now just make that commitment and holy spirit just in the next 40 to 50 years you would just continually remind them of that commitment that they've made to stick to your word to build the house on the rock and not on the sand father to build on the rock and not on the sand we thank you just for that jesus and that you are worthy of all our praise yeah.